Good afternoon, everybody. We welcome you warmly to the second monthly clinical meeting of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Uh, today, the meeting is conducted in collaboration with the College of Community Physicians of Sri Lanka. Uh, the theme for today's discussion is preventive sector services and ways of collaboration across health systems. As we all know, in Sri Lanka, the health system has the, both the curative and the preventive sectors. So the collaboration between these two sectors are very important in providing healthcare to our community. So today we have three eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Chitramali D. Silva, Director, Maternal and Child Health from the Family Health Bureau. She will be talking about maternal and child health services available from the preventive sector. The second speaker is Dr. Iresha Jayavikrama, Consultant Community Physician, RDHS Division, Putlam. She will be talking on communicable and non-communicable disease control services available from the preventive sector. Our third speaker today is Dr. Banuja Vijay Tilaka, Consultant Community Physician, Nutrition Division, Ministry of Health. He will be talking on environmental and occupational services available from the preventive sector. And today the moderator is Dr. P.K. Buddhika Mahesh, a Consultant Community Physician, PDHS office attached to the PDHS Division, Western Province, Sri Lanka. So I will hand over the sessions to Dr. P.K. Buddhika Mahesh from this moment onwards to conduct the session. On behalf of the College of Community Physicians, we would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for inviting the College of Community Physicians to collaborate with this, in this session. So as it was mentioned, so we are here to discuss about a very timely topic, uh, which is on the preventive health sector services and the ways of collaboration across health systems. And uh, the objective of this session is to highlight to our medical colleagues of various capacities about the vast services that are available in the preventive sector, uh, and to discuss the ways of improving the utilization of these services for a better collaboration across health systems. So just to give you a brief background uh, before we go into our presentations today, uh, we know that when we say preventive sector, it is an arbitrary categorization. We know any health institution according to the instance, uh, uh, the relevant instance is supposed to provide curative, preventive, health promotive as well as rehabilitative services. But we know that in general, there are some institutions which are providing more promotive and preventive services than other two types of services. And then here in this session, we are basically focusing on those institu institutions. So when we look at the healthcare systems uh, organization in Sri Lanka, we know at national level, we have three main institutions which are mainly provide, which, which are mainly focusing on preventive and promotive services. Those are the Family Health Bureau, Epidemiology Unit, and the Health Promotion Bureau, as well as our specialized campaigns and programs. And then at provincial level, we have the officers of Provincial Directorate of Health Services. Then at the district level, we have Regional Directorate of Health Services officers. And at the divisional level, we have about 354 medical officer of health areas in Sri Lanka. And also at that level, uh, other than the MOH areas, the lower level of hospital, like primary health care institutions, as well as uh, the relevant sections of the specialized campaigns join us hand in hand when delivering the health services at the public level. Uh, so we know when we consider all these four levels, there are consultants in community medicine who are called consultant community physicians and the trainees in community medicine and also medical officers as well as a quite a high number of other staff categories which collaboratively work together in delivering health services to the public. So with that background, we'll move into our symposium now. Uh, and as the first speaker of today's uh, symposium, we have Dr. Chitramalder Silva, who is the Director, Maternal and Child Health, uh, who will be talking to us on maternal and child health related preventive health sector services available in Sri Lanka. Over to you, Madam.
good afternoon to all of you uh, so i thank the slma and the sri lanka college of computer physicians uh, for organizing this symposium and also giving an overview of the services that have been extended by the uh, preventive health sector uh, to get some understanding about the services that are available uh, in our public health system so i will be talking about the uh, national family health program and also how it is the how the services are organized and what we have achieved so far uh, so when you look at the service delivery system as uh, dr buddhika mahesh highlighted uh, so our preventive health system is delivered in the decentralized health system we have nine provinces and 26 health districts and 356 health divisions which are manned by medical officers of health and also the smallest unit in this country is like public health midwife areas uh, currently we have about 6700 uh, phm divisions throughout the country represented in all the provinces uh, when you look at the higher level at the national level how the services are governed the we are under the ministry of health the central so even under the 13th amendment this policy direction technical guidance monitoring and evaluation is within the uh, national level so we have the secretary of health the director general of health services uh, we are specifically under the deputy director general of public health services and also the the family health bureau is one of the main organization of uh, the preventive health sector where we are the actually the largest uh, uh, unit of the public health unit in the ministry of health and also the, the hospital sector is uh, under the deputy director general medical services but we have a very close collaboration with the uh, curative sector as well because our implementation linked to the uh, preventive the curative the con- collaboration is very very important Uh, and also when you look at the provincial level uh, system the provincial director is the head of the, uh, the health director and then the district is in charge by the regional director or the district director of health services and the divisional level we have the medical officer of health areas and the curative health institutions are again uh, the base hospitals and below institutions are mainly under the regional director of health services but uh, the line ministry also has some major institutions under the under the purview of the ministry of health and then uh, we have a very strong monitoring and evaluation system where the routine system the data is captured through the public health midwife the public health inspectors are sent to the moiters and then monitor and evaluation unit of the family health bureau is responsible to monitor and evaluate the total maternal and child health services in this country and we have a routine uh, uh, monitoring of data on regular basis plus at end, the end of the every year we monitor the performance by conducting district maternal mortality and the district mch review meetings uh, so the preventive sector i think as i said before the province uh, under the medical officer of health and the moh is supported by uh different categories of health staff starting from public health nurse sister supervising public health midwife supervising public health inspector public health inspector and the public health midwife who is working at the grassroots level and there are other special campaign officers and the technical and the management staff who are assisting the performance of the moh at the uh, divisional level and also the curative sector again uh, has a, some role to play primary care institutions are there to provide the basic primary care services for our population uh, then medical of the maternal and child health the regional epidemiology is the more planning so they are based at the district directorate of health services at the district level and also they help to implement the national programs uh, with the with coordination of the national level organization especially the mcmch has a very good relationship with the uh, family health bureau uh, to implement all the mch related activities at the divisional level and also coordinating with the curative sector is also important now we have the cadre of consultant committee physicians also 
established at the district and the provincial level where many coordination is happening at that level when a technical expert is available. So uh, institutional healthcare delivery system is also very important uh, to, for provision of comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care services for population groups. Uh, so the services are mainly uh, managed by uh, obstetrician and gynecologist, or neonatologist, or a consultant pediatrician who are working at this uh, curative health sector. And also the divisional level, we have the smaller hospitals like primary medical care units or rural hospitals. And also uh, the community health services are drained to the smaller level of institutions. So at the national level, Family Health Bureau is responsible for advocacy, policy direction, and strategic planning, and then technical guidance and direction. So we send all the uh, guidelines, circular instructions for implementation of the programs. Then the capacity building, we do the national level training, monitoring and evaluation is done even at the national level, and also the logistic management. All the supplies that are necessary to implement uh, maternal and child health program, we monitor and we get the supplies and uh, distribution is happening to all the MCH clinics, the districts, the MOM, MOH officers, uh, just to see how the things are being implemented. Uh, so uh, when you look at the, uh, the interventions, how the services are being in, in, uh, implemented, so we use a life cycle approach. Uh, of implementation of different components of maternal and family health, like maternal and child health, family planning, women's health, and so on. So other important thing is ensuring the continuum of care across the health system. So starting from home and community level, so public health midwife visits the household level and then provide the domiciliary care, then <clears throat> There's a linkage to the first level facility where we have the primary care medical institutions and all. And then there's a referral hospital where the uh, consultant or the specialist care is available. So across the health system, the services are available. Uh, so when you look at the life cycle approach, uh, so the care provision starts when a, a couple gets married, either legally or customary, and then they are registered by the public midwife as an eligible family and provision of care for pre-pregnancy. Even before the, uh, the woman gets pregnant, the care has to be given to plan and prepare the woman for pregnancy. Then the antenatal care, once the woman gets pregnant, domiciliary and clinic-based care, and also then the intrapartum care uh, is happening at the institutional level because we have a, almost a universal uh, coverage of uh, uh, institutional deliveries, like more than 99.9% .9 of the deliveries are happening at the hospitals. Then postpartum care, immediate postpartum care is delivered at the hospital, and then when the uh, baby is discharged, mother and the baby are discharged from the hospital. The postpartum care is delivered by the public health midwife at the community level. Then infant and child care. The every child or every newborn has to be registered, provided with the child health development record and provision of all the uh, standard care to the infants and the children is done by our public health system. When the child enters into the school, the school health services take over the child and provide the care during, uh, during the school days, like conducting school medical inspections, making the schools health promotive schools, conducting immunizations and uh, doing all the health promotional activities at the school levels. So now we are moving to a, like all the schools to be promoted as health promoting school is one of our goal to achieve. Uh, then in infant and child care, I think the, now the focus is more on nutrition as well because the nutrition problems are coming up, uh, high up in this infancy and during the childhood period. 
adolescent and youth health also again we are providing services for adolescents and youth mainly the center based approach is happening and then the family planning services and other reproductive health services such as uh, well women services the screening for cervical breast cancer and the common non communicable diseases for women aged 35 and 45 years of age and also providing services for women affected with gender based violence so the gbv uh, survivors are being addressed through our primary health care staff and also there is a referral mechanism to the curative sector to provide the care so antenatal model of course uh, we have uh, a, a very all the who approved international evidence based interventions are available in our program so the uh, registration of the pregnant mothers as early as possible and provision of clinic and home based care domiciliary care by the phm and the field clinic care by moh or medical officer in a hospital and then the shared care and the specialized care by the consultant obstetrician so the growth assessment uh, uh, vandal height measurement and then uh, uh, testing for hp hemoglobin assessment and then um, assessment for immunization for tetanus toxoid all these interventions are happening at the mch clinics so uh, when you look at the natal care the intermortal care we have nearly 99.9% of the deliveries are happening in hospital and uh, of these more than 80% of the deliveries are now happening in specialized care institutions so therefore the very few deliveries are now happening in uh, smaller level institutions not moving Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when you look at the maternal care, so our ultimate aim is to for reduction of maternal mortality. So Sri Lanka has achieved a success in reduction of maternal mortality ratio, as uh, illustrated in this graph. We have a very low level of uh, maternal mortality of twenty nine point five. Now the current latest data. Per hundred thousand live births, so nearly about eighty to ninety pregnant mothers are dying every year because of the pregnancy. So, can we prevent that? I think more than sixty percent of these maternal deaths are again preventable. So, we can prevent them uh, when you look at where these deaths have happened. Almost uh, more than eighty uh, percent of the delivery my maternal deaths have happened in hospitals and also mostly in hospitals where there are uh, specialist comprehensive emergency obstetric care facilities because many of the deliveries are also happening in these hospitals so by improving quality of care in these institutions by attending to a good emergency services we should be able to reduce or prevent these uh, maternal deaths which are happening at the tertiary care institutions uh, causes of maternal deaths when you look at the obstetric hemorrhage is the leading cause so why these deaths are happening because maybe the the, the proper monitoring intrapartum monitoring postpartum monitoring is not taking place maybe inadequacy of some drugs or the supplies right and also the lack of human resources and the overcrowding of the hospital all these matters are uh, cons of concern so we always review every maternal death to identify the causative factors and the factors that have contributed to these maternal deaths that is to prevent another death in future so every maternal death in this country is reviewed and actions are proposed for further prevention of maternal deaths so the major causes are the obstetric hemorrhage then the heart disease complicating pregnancy and the respiratory problems so in 2020 we had about uh, 60 maternal deaths are due to covid so but now this has come down to a great extent we were able to vaccinate all our pregnant mothers at that time 
for COVID vaccination. And with that, we were able to reduce our maternal deaths due to COVID. Uh, when you look at the Dunitian trends in neonatal and the infant mortality again, it is uh, almost static over the past few years. So it's very hard to uh, reduce it further unless we strengthen our services. The specialized high dependency or the care for newborns is a must because more than 80% of these infant deaths are happening in the neonatal period. So the prematurity is high and low birth weight is high. So we, are there, we have to pay attention for, uh, especially during the neonatal period and to give specialized care. So when you look at the nutrition, uh, so we have the life cycle approach for nutrition interventions, starting from exclusive breastfeeding, uh, adequate complement feeding practices, then the micronutrient supplementation in uh, uh, from six months onwards. Then about the in the school, of course, we give again uh, micronutrient supplementation for school children, weekly supplementation of iron and iron folate and then uh, adolescents and then the pregnancy uh, pre uh, pre uh, period. So like that, all these uh, evidence-based nutrition interventions are available in, the, in our program. Uh, and also the malnutrition status is not a good indicator. So it had been almost static till 2016, but again with the economic downturn, we have seen an increased rates of malnutrition all forms of malnutrition is increasing now. So we are paying a lot of attention to uh, for improve the food security at the household level and also to maintain all the supplementation without a shortfall uh, to improve the nutritional status of mothers and children. Uh, the curative sector contribution uh, is important. So we cannot work alone only in the preventive sector. There's a very big contribution by the uh, curative sector. So provision of emergency obstetric and neonatal care services is very, very important. So we cannot reduce our maternal and infant and newborn mortality without a good quality improvement in the maternity and newborn care. So therefore their contribution is very, very important. So all this maternal and perinatal death surveillance system begins at the institutional level. So we visit all these hospitals for these maternal death reviews and also the perinatal death reviews have been monitored and data system is, is uh, online. We monitor all these activities even at the national level. Provision of family planning services at the hospitals, especially the sterilization services for females is very, very important, for, especially for women who are uh, who do not uh, there is no ind contraindicated for pregnancies so for those have to be provided with family planning uh, permanent family planning services then specialized care for children with comorbidities special needs including severe acute malnutrition the services are available in the curative sector the contribution of the pediatrics and other subspecialties is very very important in this regard then the establishment of Mitru PSS centers and the services for gender-based violence. The Mitru PSS centers, we have nearly 90 centers are available in curative sector where the counseling services and the referral system is taking place. And uh, their survivors are getting the services from the curative sector. Your own PSS center again is another contributory services for adolescent and youth where uh, the counseling and the uh, activities are going on in these selected about 35 centers are functioning in the hospital sector today. And also the laboratory and the specialized care services for cervical cancer screening. So these are some of the curative care and contribution uh, to implement that is the contribution for our MCH program and how they can contribute to improve our indicators better. So we are all to achieve our sustainable development goals. Sri Lanka is committed to achieve by 2030 and we have so many indicators which are SDG related, uh, MCH related SDG goals and we have the baseline and the target which was set in about uh, five, six years ago before COVID comes and maybe we had to now revisit 
our targets and to see whether we should change our targets uh, considered in the current economic crisis and the current issues that we are facing. So anyway, there are many challenges ahead of us. So we are we have a look, we have come a long way, but sustaining our achievements in this crisis situation is a major challenge ahead of us. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, for your elaborative session on maternal and child health services available on the preventive sector. So you not only uh, told us about the organization of uh, organization of uh, maternal and child health services, but you touched upon the different staff categories, and also you took us through the life cycle approach and elaborated the different services available, and also you just highlighted some of the uh, current statistics in relation to our targets. So thank you very much. And uh, we'd like to uh, request our audience who are here physically as well as through Zoom that there's a brief question and answer session will be there following all three sessions. So those who are here physically can just raise their questions at the end. And those who are joining us through Zoom can send their question through the chat facility in the Zoom. Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, we'll uh, move into our second session of this symposium. That is to highlight you all uh, on the services that are available for the control and prevention of communicable as well as non-communicable diseases. So for that, uh, we'd like to invite Dr. Iresha Jayavikrama, who is a consultant community physician attached to the Regional Director of Health Services, Puttaram, to enlighten us on that topic. Over to you, Dr. Iresha. Thank you, Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mahesh. And very good afternoon to all of you. So in the next few minutes, I'll take you through uh, the preventive sector's role in the prevention and control of communicable and non-communicable diseases. Commu communicable disease control activities are mainly coordinated through the regional epidemiologists who are consultant community physicians at the district level or the uh, medical officer epidemiology attached to the RDHS office. And also with the technical guidance of the epidemiology unit. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there are focal point medical officers appointed and uh, attached to the RDH office uh, who are carrying out the activities related to the specialized campaigns, such as malaria, filaria, uh, and also uh, chest TB and chest diseases, and also a consultant venerologist is attached to the STD clinics. So the uh, communicable disease control activities are mainly focused on disease surveillance and activities related to the specialized campaigns, uh, such as dengue, leprosy, rabies, malaria, and, uh, and so on. And also the activities related to the expanded program of immunization is EPI. And also the food safety and hygiene, water quality, sanitation, and waste disposal, disaster management, and finally the health promotion and health education activities. So further, uh, going into further details, the disease surveillance system consists of routine surveillance uh, and also the special surveillance on selected communicable diseases at the uh, MOH or the field level, and also the sentinel site surveillance at the hospital level. It is a legal, there's a legal mandate uh, to notify the communicable diseases since 1897, 
uh, any medical uh, practitioner professing to treat a patient with suspected communicable disease is uh, uh, sh shall notify to the proper authority. If not, uh, uh, he or she shall be guilty of an offense. So this is the uh, list of notifiable diseases in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, as you can see, there are two groups. Uh, group A, including cholera, plague, and yellow fever, uh, should be notified immediately uh, to the proper authority. And the group B diseases are expected to, uh, to be notified uh, using the notification form H544. When it comes to the special surveillance, uh, detailed information uh, are collected uh, to plan and uh, prevent this, uh, this, this uh, communicable diseases as listed here, uh, cholera, and all the vaccine preventable diseases and uh, Japanese encephalitis and dengue, human rabies, hepatitis, leptospirosis, and so, uh, so on. And when it comes to the specialized campaign, uh, in prevention and control of dengue outbreaks, uh, uh, preventive sector uh, mainly focus on carrying out the uh, premise inspections uh, and also uh, vector control activities and also the entomological surveillance. When it comes to the winter control, we are using temiphos for the la as a larvicide and also uh, siphonothrin uh, as a uh, adult uh, infected uh, vector control uh, method. And the entomological surveillance are being carried out by the, uh, the uh, larva, larva surveillance and also uh, adult vector surveillance and also the ovitrap surveillance. That's also an indirect uh, adult vector surveillance. So when it comes to the leprosy, uh, the house-to-house -house visits in identified pockets or the high-risk communities are being carried out and also uh, contact tracing of the uh, confirmed uh, these cases are also carried out by the uh, preventive sector healthcare workers. Uh, doxycycline is being given for, as a prophylactic treatment to prevent leptospirosis for the high risk individuals before the exposures. And uh, uh, the vigilant uh, surveillance, is, surveillance uh, at the uh, field level is carrying out to prevent the reintroduction and the re-establishment of the malaria uh, after detection of any confirmed cases. So, uh, and also preventive sector plays a major role uh, in tracing contacts uh, of this uh, TB and also STD patients. And uh, the, uh, the preventive sector, uh, the activities are mainly focused on the uh, serological uh, surveillance uh, by collecting night blood films to, uh, as a uh, filaria control measure. So when it comes to the expanded program of immunization, uh, it's, it, it is shown that uh, this is one of the most cost-effective and also evidence-based method uh, to prevent the uh, communicable diseases by uh, vaccinating the infants and also by giving the booster doses for the children at appropriate age with the scheduled time gaps. Uh, the system ensures the equal accessibility uh, to uh, immunization services to uh, maintain high population level immunity. So this is the national immunization schedule. I know you all are very aware about this, so I will not go into detail of this slide. So the maintenance of uh, food safety and hygiene uh, carries a weight in uh, prevention of uh, foodborne diseases. So the registration and inspection of food handling establishments and regular inspection of uh, food items for quality and evidence of contamination uh, is, uh, is very important uh, to, uh, to ensure the food safety and hygiene uh, in the community. So uh, uh, the providing typhoid vaccination and educating these uh, uh, different stakeholders uh, on food safety and hygiene also a part of the uh, uh, preventive sector responsibilities. So uh, 
since inception of the inception of this uh, public health system in Sri Lanka, the environmental health is uh, have been given considered a, a, a primary uh, thing to control these uh, communicable diseases. So the regular monitoring of drinking water quality and also uh, providing guidance for proper disposal of human excreta uh, by promoting latrine facilities, especially at the uh, rural and the uh, state sectors, and also uh, uh, the educating uh, the importance of waste segregation and waste disposal to control of uh, pests. Uh, during disasters, it's vital uh, uh, to prevent the spread of communicable diseases. So for that, actually we ensure the provision of safe drinking water, food, and also uh, uh, the disposal of solid waste, and also the disposal of human excreta and the vector control activities, uh, especially in these temporary shelters. Okay, let's move into the uh, prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. So when it comes to the non-communicable diseases, uh, the, the district focal point is the medical officer, NCD, uh, is working with the technical guidance of the uh, directorate of uh, non-communicable unit and also with the guidance of the consultant community physician at the district level. So uh, the main activity is focused on the, the promoting uh, healthy lifestyle and also uh, the averting uh, the modifiable risk exposures in the communities. Uh, the, the common risk factors identified are the uh, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, tobacco use, alcohol consumption, and uh, air pollution. So uh, when it comes to the primordial and the primary prevention, most of the activities are uh, uh, implemented uh, through the life cycle approach, uh, especially at the MOH level. So from the preconception, the during pregnancy, and infant, young child, adolescent, and towards the elders, uh, we promote uh, uh, healthy food and also active lifestyle and also uh, the uh, proper optimal nutritional status. Uh, under the school health program, the uh, conducting school medical inspections to assess the nutritional status and also to screen and detect the uh, common uh, health problems. And also uh, we promote uh, and we support the schools to uh, implement the healthy canteen policy and also uh, 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 to, to develop the school as a health promoting school setting. So in the uh, well woman clinic services, uh, the main target groups are the 75, uh, sorry, 35 and 45 age cohorts, but not only that, uh, the, whoever comes into the uh, well born and clinic services, we, uh, we are ready to provide the services, especially to, uh, to assess the nutritional status and also to screen diabetes, hypertension, and also uh, the cervical uh, abnormalities and also the breast abnormalities. Uh, and also uh, medical office of health, the MOH level, uh, they are uh, carrying out activities related to the health promote, uh, developing health promoting settings, uh, such as happy village settings and also uh, schools, preschool settings, and also promoting uh, uh, healthy work settings and also uh, healthcare institutions. Uh, and also uh, the, it is with paramount importance with, for this, uh, the preventive, Prevention of NCD activities, the community empowerment and the social mobilization uh, play a major role. And also uh, the intersectoral coordination uh, has shown promising, it's a promising strategy uh, to uh, implement these uh, preventive activities at the community setting. So mainly the secondary prevention activities are uh, carried out through the healthy lifestyle centers uh, in healthcare institutions. Uh, the screening of adults, especially uh, 20 to 34 years with risk factors and uh, above 35 uh, adults with apparently healthy adults. 
uh, are being screened and also assessment of risk behaviors uh, to identify and uh, avoid their uh, risk uh, exposures and also uh, the follow -up, regular follow-ups are also happening uh, in these life, healthy lifestyle centers. Uh, the primary, uh, the primordial and primary prevention activities are also uh, taken place in these healthy lifestyle centers uh, by the uh, medical officer and as well as the public health nursing officer attached to the uh, primary medical care units uh, to uh, aware the uh, healthy uh, uh, habits and also to uh, avoid these uh, modifiable risk factors. So going a little further into the uh, cancer control uh, activities, uh, the National Cancer Control Program uh, uh, provides the technical guidance and also it monitors and uh, monitor and evaluate the, uh, the preventive activities at the uh, national and the, uh, the district levels. So it, uh, the, the national strategic plan includes seven strategies. The strategy two mainly focus on the primary prevention uh, through health promotion. All these activities are implemented from national level up to the, the community level. And the, uh, the community level activities are mainly uh, implemented through the MOH officers and also the other hospital uh, the setting. Uh, so thank you. I hope uh, this presentation helped you to get the scope of this, uh, the pre preventive sector's role on the communicable and non-communicable diseases. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Iresha. You, you actually categorize these services under communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and, and explained us the general services as well as the specific services available, and also the routinely available services, and as well as the services which are available in specific instances like disasters as well. So many thanks again. So with that, we will be moving to the third session of this symposium. That is to discuss about the environmental health services, occupational health services, and the food safety services available through the preventive health sector. So we would like to invite Dr. Banuja Vijay Dilaka, who is a consultant community physician attached to the Directorate of Environmental Health, Occupational Health, and Food Safety to enlighten us on this topic. Over to you, Dr. Banuja. Uh, thank you, Mahesh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you very much for the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, for arranging this uh, meeting. And I'm representing the College of Community Physicians. So my role is to explain the preventive health services related to environmental, occupational health, and food safety under the Ministry of Health. So, so we have basically three units under the directorate, food safety unit, environmental health unit, and occupational health unit. So they are the focal points at the national level. And uh, so, uh, so this is the food safety structure under the Ministry of Health. So national level, so our focal points are here. So I will first discuss the food safety and then I will move to the environmental and occupational health sectors. So, uh, so national level, it's mainly food safety unit and also we call it food administration and control unit, food control administration unit and chief food authority and food advisory committee also coming at the national level. So Chief Food Authority is the Director General of Health Services and Food Advisory Committee is a multi-sectoral body uh, stipulated uh, with all players in the food chain. And district level, so there are many uh, players I know link. So one thing is we have to understand these food authorities. These are local food authorities and we have authorized officers and also regional director of health services and consultant community physicians and medical officers assigned for environmental occupation and food safety units are looking after the uh, services at district level. So national level, uh, 
at the national level so it's mainly uh, so we are coordinating many food safety activities and actually implementation of activities under the food act is happening at the district level can i remove this ah, thank you and uh, food authorities actually medical officers of health are the food authorities except for the municipal council areas and authorized officers are mainly medical officers for health and food and drug inspectors public health inspectors as well as food inspectors so in addition we have a supportive structure so we have authorized food labs and we have codex contact point and also we have judicial support so you have to understand this food chain because all players in this food chain are responsible for to ensure the food safety in the country so it's actually from farm to consumers farm to pork so production to consumers there are many uh, parties are involved and responsible for assuring food safety so i will start from the national level the services and the responsibilities so first of all the coordination and collaboration with the players in the food chain as i mentioned before this very important this is mainly happening through the food advisory committee headed by chief food authority that's a district general then we have a responsibility in, in amending the food act that's the main legal uh, legal uh, legal uh, legal thing and also the food regulations we are developing food regulations and also we are supposed to develop the food safety which is in progress and also as same as in the other programs so monitoring and evaluation of district food safety activities are being carried out and also we are conducting national food surveys and surveys so at national level we have main responsibility in supporting domestic food control activities so how do we do that so we have national level planning and also capacity building programs and training develop guidelines and provide technical support whenever necessary especially with regards to new development of uh, regulations and also resource allocation and management at the national level so border control activities is another responsibility at the national level that's mean food import control and food export control so food import control inspection at the borders so in all ports we have our authorized officers they will check document inspection all 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 food items imported and physical inspection as well as chemical and microbiological microbiological analysis whenever necessary this is done according to a plan and also radioactive testing so when we export the food we are not providing uh, health so we have to provide health certificate health certificates whenever required it's not for all food items but the country is that uh, we exporting country is requested a certificate we have to provide a health certificate it also has a, a procedure including the inspection of uh, food items and uh, factories so finally uh, the national level responsibilities strengthening the food analysis the laboratory capacity capacities so as i mentioned before we have five authorized food labs especially medical research institute and national institute of health science anuradhapura kurunagala and kanji so we support for the capacity building and also in sustainable development as well as the standard maintenance in addition so implement codex mechanism is also one of our responsibility and also investigate international food alerts that is infosan alerts i'm not going into detail and also finally consumer awareness at the national level also happening that's true world food court uh, world food safety day and also we have food safety weeks and special situations we have developed some posters and special guidelines to be special during this covid related situations and also some food regulation itself are actually they are consumer awareness kind of food regulations i will show in the next slide some examples so these are some of the regulations uh, where in the forthcoming label regulation this uh, this uh, what is called the nutrient labeling going to be mandatory 
So it's also a kind of uh, consumer awareness. And also, as you know, it's already there. That uh, color coding regulation is also already there. So this is also a kind of consumer awareness, uh, supporting the consumer awareness about the fat, salt, and sugar. So these are some new uh, events. So we are already done. We are already doing this approval of health claims in food labels. So if anyone wants to make a claim, especially health claim on a food label, they need to have a, uh, approval from the chief food authority. So we are uh, coordinating that process. In addition, in from, with the new this uh, the with the new uh, regulations. So all we all these food advertisement according to a uh, forthcoming regulations, food advertisements with health claims need prior approval from the chief food authority. So that's going to be a, a new event, and also uh, new food regulations have been developed. That means trans fat regulations. So far, we don't have any trans fat regulations. We are going to regulate the trans fat in food items and also aflatoxin regulations we are revising and also wheat flour fortification uh, to combat the, this generalized anemia among the population. So we are going to uh, fortify with iron and folic acid. So finally, registration of dietary supplements. This is also going to be happening. Dietary supplements are to be registered prior to importation because we have noticed unnecessary. There are so many unnecessary dietary supplements are coming into market. So that's the national level. So we, if we move to the district level. So district level, uh, so as I, I mentioned before, the main chief food authority is the direct general. But under that, uh, we have local food authorities. So local food authorities are responsible of assuring food safety of that area. So municipal councils area, the municipal council would be the food, local food authority unless the power has been delegated to the Minister, uh, medical office of health. In all other areas, medical offices of health are the local food authorities by act. So then there's another category, authorized officers. They are the people who are really actively taking actions under the Food Act. So authorized, they are authorized under the Food Act to conduct food control activities under the Food Act. So especially in our setup, the medical officers of all medical officers of health, food and drug inspectors, public health inspectors, and there's another category called food inspectors. They are authorized under the Food Act to carry out uh, all uh, food safety activities under the food act. So other activities, uh, if I mention the activities, so some of the activities already has been mentioned by the previous speaker and food premises registration, inspection, grading, food handlers, training and registration. This food handlers, food premises registration is a fairly new, uh, new uh, event. So in the future, all food uh, premises will be registered and so we are planning to maintain the standards through that process so another responsibility of the district level routing routine food and water sampling so this is actually end, for, end product testing and corrective action including uh, judicial proceedings uh, and also at the at the ground level, special food rates, especially in special situation. In festival seasons, they are doing special food rates. And also capacity building and awareness programs is one of the other uh, responsibilities lying with the uh, district level officers. So, so these are also some of the responsibilities lying with the district level officers, as I mentioned before, regional director of health services and medical officers of health, as well as other authorized officers. So this is very important. Actually, end product testing itself cannot ensure the food safety. Therefore, we have to go for the preventive risk-based risk approach in collaboration with other stakeholders. These measures, actually, they can't take alone. We need to do them with, in collaboration with the other stakeholders, like uh, Ministry of Agriculture, or maybe um, livestock production. So promoting good agricultural practices, so correct use of agrochemicals, good animal farming practices, correct use of antibiotics, good manufacturing processes, use of health technology, actually prevent 
create transport formation. There are many new technologies are available, and also very important to assure good storage and transport mechanism during the transportation. So all these are responsibilities and services provided by the district team. And I'll be now moving to the from food safety to the environment and occupational health activities. As I mentioned before, they are also focal points under the Ministry of Health. So environment health unit, they coordinate and collaborate environmental health related activities with the Ministry of Environment, Central Environment Authority and other relevant ministries. So environmental health unit contribution for the development of environmental related policies. So they contribute to develop policies from the other ministries as well. And also development of national action plans on chemical safety, environmental pollution, and climate changes. Capacity building on environmental health for undergraduate and postgraduate students, and also conduct basic in-service training to health staff and other sectors. So this healthcare waste management program is one of the main program uh, monitored and conducted by the environmental health unit in collaboration with the district team, conducting surveys to identify uh, healthcare waste manage healthcare waste ma uh, management, water sanitation and hygiene practices in healthcare institutions. Then they develop development of national and provincial action plans on healthcare healthcare waste man waste management. Ensure the availability of infrastructure facilities related to healthcare waste management, and also strengthening healthcare waste management practices in healthcare institutions. So healthcare waste management is one of the main role uh, coming under the environmental health unit. So when moving to the occupation health unit, so their main responsibilities ensure health and uh, environmental, uh, sorry, occupational safety of all workers in all workplaces. Activities are carried out mainly through the medical officers of health and public health inspectors. Then, then medical officers of health and public health inspectors should regularly inspect all workplaces in his or her area to identify health hazard and to take preventive and corrective actions. Then other uh, activities under the occupation health unit, development of guidelines for different work settings, especially during the past COVID-19 pandemic and also contribution for the development of national policies, as I mentioned before, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic with other stakeholders, such as Minister of Labor and Industry. Conducting awareness program and supervision of workplaces, and also, they're also doing capacity building on occupational health for undergraduate and postgraduate, as well as basic in-service training on health staff. So this is the end, actually, the briefly, the services provided by the Food Safety, Environment and Occupational Health of the Directorate under the Ministry of Health. So our direct is Dr. Srivardhana. We have three consultants. Myself, Dr. Inoka Saravira, looking after Environment and Occupational Health, and also Dr. Guddika Subhasinghe. Thank you very much for providing this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Panuja Vijayati Lekar for vividly describing to us the food safety services as well as environmental health services and occupational health services from the national level up to the implementation level. So that concludes the scheduled three sessions of this symposium. Now we have a limited time to answer your questions. Now we have received uh, several questions uh, over the Zoom facilities chat uh, uh, service as well as physically. So when we go through these uh, questions, uh, I, I think considering the time restraints also, we will be able to select two of them because many of the questions are based on one theme that is related to challenges and the suggestions in relation to improving these services. So we would like to first ask from Dr. Jitra Maldi Silva and Dr. Iresha Vijay Vikrama uh, regarding the maternal and child health services as well as co communicable as well as non-communicable uh, control and preventive services. What are the current challenges that are faced in the implementation of these services, as well as your suggestions in improving the collaboration across the health systems? So shall we start with uh, Chitramali, Madam, Madam, uh, regarding maternal and child health services? I think as a country, we are facing with this economic downturn. So uh, the major challenge that we face today 
is the the cash flow within the ministry of health uh, and also within the hospitals also the same thing so therefore there is a lack of uh, supplies especially starting from drugs to the other supplies like even the 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 goes the the supplies to the hospitals the drugs injections uh, and also the equipment there is a major challenge on that so even for the preventive services now we have to supply all these uh, commodities right to the grassroots level one good example is the family planning commodities at the moment we don't have some items even for one month supply so that is the reality so we have begin with the international loan agencies the partners uh, to get the supplies uh, to our country right so therefore uh, i think that is the biggest challenge to supply the continuous uh, commodity supplementation with the available uh, small amount of money and also getting the donors to support this and also the other problem is the human resource issues right so we know that the migration now that there are a lot of outbound migrants and our our even doctors the nurses the other categories are moving out so there is a lack uh, the vacuum that will be created within the national organizations at the provincial and also the institutional level so how are we to cope up with that and with the retirement scheme again some categories of staff are getting uh, early retirement and going out so the human resource problem is a one big challenge and also the supplies and the equipment and uh, this thing but anyway now how are we managing with this so we always get the good support from either unicef who or world bank so they are the main primary donors now even uh, for the family health bureau now last year our total funding uh, almost all uh, our printing actually so we need about more than 1 1 to 2 billion uh, rupees for printing per se even printing of the child health development record the pregnancy records by every pregnant mother the records that are maintained by the midwives so like that there are a lot of records that we need money so we were depending on the world bank and other donors to unicef and the world bank for printing of these uh, documents so anyway we are continuing the services with our, uh, uh, with our good collaboration with the other agencies but anyway it is a big challenge we don't know how to sustain it during the latter part of this year yeah. uh, thank you madam i think you answered the first question that is that, that is on the challenges faced currently so madam would you like to finish this off with the second part also that is that uh, there were questions asking on what are your suggestions to improve the collaboration uh, of the preventive services uh, with the curative sector mainly so would you like to address that question also madam yeah i think uh, the uh, the good collaboration within the preventive and the curative between the preventive and the curative is very very important we have linkages there m o m c h the c c p was sitting at the r d h s office level so they have to have a close collaboration with the curative counterparts so we always encourage them to have a have a good relationship uh, with them and also the in the hospital we have the m o public health in the public health is the one there are no ccps at the moment so in the public health has to coordinate all the public health programs which are happening at the hospital may be quality improvement programs or maternal death surveillance uh, meetings so like that so the mo public health mo mch uh, the ccp at the district level that coordination has to happen very well even at the national level we have a lot of technical advisory committees at the national level and in all these technical advisory committees the curative counterpart is there like the obstetricians the pediatricians uh, the the ministry officials so like that we have all the representation even the provincial and the district uh, participation is there in our technical advisory committees so i think with that we are uh, able to have good collaboration and the partnerships of visiting the hospital communicating with the curative staff attending if possible the management committee meetings Uh, of the hospital and also attend the perinatal death reviews and the maternal death review meetings by our preventive sector counterparts so i know mohs are attending the even the midwife has to attend when there's a perinatal death in the hospital where the midwife was serving so like that that, that collaboration is uh, is uh, 
uh, they are on paper, but uh, most of the places it is happening. So we have to strengthen the coordination and also maybe giving a small feedback report, giving a minute of the meeting, uh, giving to the preventive and the creative sector. So those are actually uh, important areas to have a good uh, relationship within the preventive. And also the emerge conference, we say, get the clinicians into the monthly conference of the emergers to update their knowledge, to talk about their issues, what they see in the antenatal care, if they see some mothers are not being properly examined by in the in our local level clinics. So give the feedback to the uh, MOHs or the midwives uh, by the clinicians. So like that, we, there are a lot of opportunities are there to improve the coordination right. and the collaboration. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam. And Dr. Iresha, would you like to compliment Madam's answer with uh, whatever related to communicable disease control or non-communicable disease control or prevention? Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, communicable disease control, uh, disease surveillance play a main role because the, the whole the process starts uh, uh, with the receival of the uh, notification form. So uh, the little delay in uh, receiving this notification uh, forms from uh, curative uh, institutions, uh, we take it as a challenge actually to uh, plan our preventive activities. And also, uh, as Madam clearly mentioned, the uh, limited human resource at the implementation level, it also affects the uh, prevention and control of communicable as well as the uh, non-communicable diseases. So uh, the contribution actually we expect from our uh, curative sector colleagues, uh, we, uh, we actually we request uh, and uh, we pledge you to send the notifications on suspicion of the, uh, any communicable or uh, the disease. I mean, we don't need the confirmation actually because we just want to plan the preventive uh, the activities at the, uh, the ground level. So even later on, the diagnosis differs from the previous one. It doesn't matter because we have already uh, the, uh, completed the preventive activities at the preventive, uh, the, the community setting. So, and also we expect uh, the, the hospital settings, uh, the sentinel sites to, uh, uh, to continue and also uh, to adhere to the guidelines and uh, send relevant uh, the, our reportings and also returns on time to the district as well as to the national level. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Iresha. And there are several other questions based on food safety services. So we would like to direct two of those to Dr. Banuja Vijay Tilaka. Uh, now there's one question um, uh, from the audience that is that, uh, are there activities to ensure food security at uh, initial level? Example, food and antibiotics given to animals. And I'll, I'll tell the second question also, you can give a combined answer. The, the, the other question is, any actions taken to ensure nutritious food availability? Example, currently most food establishments in the country have unhealthy food, such as, like they, they have mentioned, uh, kothu roti, fried rice, and uh, for dinner. So those are the two questions. So Dr. Banjo, you can uh, give a combined answer for those. Yes. Thank you very much for uh, these questions. Yes. Actually, now we are mainly prioritizing and focusing mainly on the end product testing. So we need end product testing. That means, so we are testing the end product. What is there any health hazard? But actually we have to go back as mentioned in the question, we have to look at the initial stages. Yes, we are doing that. The answer is yes. So, but you know, it's actually changing the uh, attitude and habits. That means good agricultural practices, good manufacturing practices. So problem is now actually food is a business now, right? So need, they need the profit. They need the good yield, more yield. Therefore, with knowing or unknowing, they are, they are sometimes some people are use that they are using uh, the not appropriately uh, antibiotic, maybe uh, agrochemicals, right? So as a consequence, we have detected some uh, agro uh, some uh, antibiotic residues in some uh, some food item. So what we have done is actually this is can, the, the the solutions cannot we can't do alone in the Ministry of Health. So, so we have collaboratively with the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. So we have doing some events as example now uh, for the Ministry of Agriculture, they are developing a regulation to control the uh, animal feed. So that's one of the actions like that. And awareness programs are happening, but, but it's really difficult task 
uh, because one thing is it, it's a changing of the attitudes and practices and also there's a business so they are always one of their priorities to have more profit anyway that's happening and we are doing uh, activities as as possible less as we could and the second one is actually is there any uh, measures to ensure uh, nutritious food actually we under the food act uh, there is no way of prohibiting uh, anything called not non that mean uh, uh, we can't prohibit any food item unless it unless it violates the food act or regulations and also there is no need of any registration prior registration of any food items therefore uh, legally it is not possible but the, we have to understand that uh, the food debt and the legal proceeding is not the only strategy to establish the new, uh, healthy eating therefore actually nutrition division are taking so many activities through food based dietary guidelines and also awareness programs to make the people's to the where the people what is food, uh, what is nutritious food and so that has to be coming that mean that the demand has to be created more for the healthy food healthier food options uh, otherwise there is no way of prohibiting uh, as he mentioned any kothu or fried rice unless they violate any food regulations so thank you very much dr banuja so i think due to, due to the constraints constraints imposed by the time so we'll conclude the question and answer session with that question Uh, so we'd like to thank the sri lanka medical association on behalf of the college of community medicine of sri lanka for inviting us uh, to collaborate uh, in in uh, conducting this session and we like to especially thank our panel members who represented the college of community medicine of sri lanka dr chitramal silva dr iresha jayavikram and dr banuj vijay tilaka uh, for participating in this activity despite their busy schedules so thank you madam uh, and dr iresha and dr banuj so we like to uh, uh, thank the slme again on behalf of the college of community medicine sri lanka and uh, we hope that you are able to get the summary of the preventive services available in sri lanka under the broad domains into your head under the maternal and child health services uh, disease control services as well as environmental occupational and food safety services thank you and wish you all a great day thank you uh, on behalf of the sri lanka medical association i wish to thank the college of community physicians all three speakers and the moderator for very fruitful discussion and your elaborative lectures on different services available from the preventive sector and the structure of preventive services from the ministry as well as other institutions providing preventive care now i wish to call upon uh, all three speakers starting from dr chitramali di silva dr iresha jayavikrama dr banuj vijay tilaka and the moderator dr buddhika mahesh to receive the tokens of appreciation provided from the sri lanka medical association thank you